Welcome to episode 163 of the Grip Strip Podcast, the first time, long time edition of the Grip Strip Podcast. I'm your host, Philip Matthew, coming back from a very busy weekend out of the house, uh, doing some interesting things. And as always, I'm back with my co host, the iRacing Indy 500 champion, a computer genius, a gentleman, and a scholar. And he decided to stay up and put himself through the whole entire Australian Grand Prix. His name is Josh Fine. What's going on, brother? Hey, I'm doing great, Phil, and yeah, I decided to punish myself somehow, if you want to call it that, and uh, stay up and watch the or most of the um, F1 Grand Prix at uh, Melbourne, Australia this past weekend, but which was pretty interesting. But yeah, myself, you know, doing great and everything, of course, uh, including that F1 race, IndyCar, NASCAR, a lot of action across all of those, uh, which we'll get into in a couple minutes. Um, so yeah, ready to get into it. And also first time ever rocking the Dale Jr. Sun drop shirt. So, um, yeah, I finally, uh, put that one on earlier. So, um, it's a good shirt. Glad to have it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's your junior fan. So the fact is you finally have the sun drop merch. It's that's good. I've, I want, I've been marking out for junior since he became the announcer, Dale jr. And then, so I've been buying all his merch, like one of those, one of those rabid fans that bought all of his die cast back in the day and basically has half their house full of them or whatever. Like all, a lot of them June bug fans of, of yesteryear. But for me, I'm rocking my, because I volunteered for the special Olympics bowling tournament this past weekend. So I'm rocking the shirt uh, for that. It was cool to watch those athletes go out there. Some of them could really bowl. I'll tell you, um, put me to shame for sure. Um, and they are having fun. Uh, speaking of having fun, uh, is Joseph Newgarden, uh, after a bad uh, St. Pete uh, season opener, he goes back out and does what he usually does, which is win uh, at Texas and uh, beats Pato Award and Alex Palo. Those three drivers dominated the show. We'll get into that race and the point standings as they will be going to Long Beach uh, here in a couple weeks' time. Uh, Cup and Xfinity were at Richmond, and Kyle Larson uh, continues the Hendrick uh, momentum early in the season. Byron, whether he has Rudy Fugel or not, has probably been the best driver this season early on. Led the most laps yesterday and then um, got summarily sent by (laughs) Christopher Bell uh, late in the race, but whatever, it's fine. Uh, Second place was was uh, Josh Berry in the nine car. So his best career finish in the cup series. He didn't want to move his teammate. Didn't really get a great restart on the last one, but we'll get into all that in the cup race. It was Hendrick and Gibbs benefit like it has been for many years there. Uh, Chandler Smith uh, earned his first Xfinity win, a race where I kind of thought Josh Berry was going to win. It looked like he was in position to on the long run. Then the caution started to come out. Uh, Jeremy Clemens decided to stop in the middle of pit road instead of pulling into the back into the back uh, garage area uh, where it wouldn't have mattered. He'd have been off the racetrack. Um, that kind of affected the entire race there. Chandler Smith also thanked his smoking hot wife in um, in his post race post uh, on his front stretch interview. So credit to him on that. Um, maybe he'll start putting uh, her name as smoking hot wife in his phone, just like Joey Logano. Uh, Again, all Geyer gets a dash for cash. So we'll get into all that with the Xfinity. The truck series was Nick Sanchez dominating on Saturday evening at Texas, uh, leading all but four laps of the race, only to end up getting wrecked by uh, Carson Hosa uh, on the final lap, uh, taking out not only Sanchez, but Zane Smith and uh, Tr- Christian Eckes. So the two guys that have two regulars that have won so far this year, um, and then a guy in Sanchez who now he, he had a chance to win at Atlanta dominates this race. Uh, Kyle Busch Motorsports equipment up there. Uh, Purdy is pseudo teammate ends up benefiting as well. But Carson Ozevar gets his first victory in full Ross Chastain style. Uh, Fish Lips won, of course, at Australia. But who finished second was a surprise relatively compared to where he has been the last year or so. His name is Sir Lewis Hamilton uh, getting up there. And uh, Fred Alonso gets yet another third-place finish. So consistency reigning there. Uh, The three red flags marred the race, probably. I guess Michael Massey might have snuck into the the stewards' room again 
uh, because the way they ran that race on Sunday, Saturday, late Saturday night, our time or late or early Sunday morning, our time here on the East coast. Um, it looked like Michael Massey was back in the, uh, in the, control of the series because of how bad it was run you get all that and all the race and all the key players outside of those three uh the roundup is pretty uh tight and simple uh f2 and f3 last week at albert park along with the supercars uh, if you drive a chevy camaro in the supercars championship i think you're in good shape uh moto gp and moto two are in argentina and the winter nationals that are is basically in the spring now, uh, took place at Pomona. We will make our, we'll preview and make picks for Bristol Dirt Cup and Trucks, the only race on the uh, docket here for Easter weekend, but also understanding that they're going against the tradition unlike any other. That's what I've usually called it for the week of the Masters, but I wasn't I wasn't in that mode, but maybe we'll see depending on who wins on Sunday or whenever the Masters ends uh, because of the amount of rain they're going to have this week. Uh, we'll talk about the make their preview and picks. Josh will talk about his exploits on iRacing and other gaming in the sim segment. Did some Gen 4 uh, cup racing last week, so get into that and we'll uh, close the deal. So first we will go with the IndyCar series, uh, which took place um, at Texas Motor Speedway. And, uh, you know, for what it is, one of the worst racetracks ever made. Uh, for once, it actually put on a decent show for the first time. I think it's probably the first time since they redid the arrow. They put the common arrow on on the IndyCar. Uh, this, this, whatever, I the IR. 18 or whatever iteration it might be the probably the best race they've had there in at, at texas in a while likely because they went to resin instead of the full-on grip strip uh they they also um they also went and they didn't have as much of the pj1 spray i think they spent more time trying to make sure the pj1 spray wore off and uh they bedded in the the track a lot better so in all all in all it was a good race and it definitely uh it was dominated by three guys it was dominated by the winner of course joseph newgarden but uh pato award uh gets a consecutive second place finish so two seconds to start the year had a chance to win this race and um Leaves with the points, still has a points lead, or re, or takes the points lead going to Long Beach, and um, so that was a good. And Alex Pillow in in his lame duck year goes and gets a um, gets a third place finish there. So um, let's see here. Bring the race results up. We'll get in just over two hours for a, a race that was 250 laps at Texas. That's pretty good. Only, but and that's after. And a, what is it? 20% of the race was run under yellow too. That's crazy. That makes it even crazier. I mean, they measure Texas motor speedway on, in the Indy cars as 1.44 miles, um, right down to the nth degree right there to give you all the accuracy. Joseph new garden wins over Pato award by 1.28 seconds. Alex Polo was six tenths behind award. David Malukas uh, finished fourth and Scott Dixon finished fifth. As uh, Scott McLaughlin, who had done well at this race last year, dominated, ended up finishing, uh, ended up finishing sixth. And Colton Herta was the last car on the lead lap in seventh in his first race without his dad on the on the timing stand as his uh, uh, what do you call strategist because he had swapped they swapped his and Kyle Kirkwood's strategist around Marcus Erickson, the winner at St. Pete was 8th, Callum Eilat 9th, and Elio Castro-Neves was 10th. Uh, we'll go through here, uh, Augustin Canapino, the teammate of Callum Eilat, in his first oval race finished one lap down in 12th, ahead of Ed Carpenter, a very <laughs> well exper very uh, experienced driver on ovals in his first race of the season. Will Power was two laps down in 16th. The, the Ray Hall cars were basically all trash, uh, yesterday 
Harvey and Lundgaard finished three laps down in 18th, 19th, and Ray Hall uh, got taken out by Devlin Francesco. I mean, why wouldn't he? It's Devlin Francesco. I mean, he caused a stupid wreck there last year. Kyle Kirkwood last year had led laps and then crashed out of the race this year. He didn't lead laps and he crashed out of the race. I don't think, yeah, he did. Yeah, lead or something. So he didn't even lead this year. Um, and then Felix Rosenquist had qualified on pole and ended up wrecking. And um, was it the total to 11? Yeah, Sasato wrecked his car after starting in the top 10. Yeah, it's turn, yeah, six in turn four. So the amount of laps they spent trying to clear up. I mean, for one car crashes to spend 12 and 14 laps under yellow is, is pretty pretty bad but whatever um i mean but for joseph newgarden great recovery uh for him to after what was in a a rare you know misstep for him at saint pete not having a great run and give getting himself right back in the mix early in the season because now they're going to be running they're going to have a little bit of momentum going that's the right time to go and get this win get back on track because now they're going to be running Long Beach. They're going to run uh, Bar Baba, uh, which is one of his best racetracks, basically his home game. It was Pato's home game yesterday, and I think he had the most fans there by far. Uh, I don't think it was it was hard to tell who had the most fans. He had his whole entire front of his truck was full of fans during the prior to the race. Let alone there was a whole entire grandstand committed to Pato Award fans. So. As a Pato Award fan, that's pretty cool. Uh, didn't get the win, but you end up finishing second, getting the points lead. Polo, the champion two years ago, uh, looking uh, looking more like the guy that, that won the championship two years ago than the guy that was out there last year. Uh, Malukas proving once again his oval prowess after running so well at Gateway last summer, coming out on the big oval and putting in a great performance there and um he didn't yeah but i mean that's something to look at especially for indy and then scott dixon doing scott dixon things and to be right in right in position this early in the season usually one has to come back in points after early season mishaps to be third in points after two races uh might be a problem for everybody else in his drive for seven but Joseph Newgarden, Josh, ends up getting that victory and Paddle Award um, showing maturity in in a sense when he could have went for the win. But I think Newgarden had him covered and he took what was the best finish he could get and decided I'm going to fight for another day and keep it clean because we'll need this piece for Indy here in a month's time or whatever, six weeks' time. So that's what they, they were thinking there at Arrow McLaren. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, first of all, you know, for Joseph Newgarden, just the way he dominated this race, and then also Pato, um, both of them as well. I mean, they led a majority of this race, Newgarden leading 123 laps, uh, Pato led 91 laps. Um, you know, you talk about Indy and, you know, getting ready for that. Um, I think early on, like going into the month of May, um, I think you have to consider them both to be uh, pretty good favorites uh, to, you know, potentially win the race or, you know, to, you know, be up there potentially. And um, New Garden dominated thoroughly and he had the best car. He was able to um, navigate through traffic like a knife through butter. Pato was able to keep up with him. So, I, you know, I think they have a, a lot of potential for, um, you know, being the favorites at the Indy 500. And, you know, look at last year, McLaren, you know, Indy 500, um, you know, they couldn't make the pass, uh, the winning pass, because they didn't have enough downforce compared to, um, you know, they already trimmed out compared to Ganassi. And, you know, this race, they, they looked like, you know, they were, they were able to make really good passes uh, in traffic and Pato was able to keep up with New Garden there. And you know, I think if the last caution didn't come out with uh, Grosjean, you know, spinning out into the wall um, off turn two, I think, you um, Pato probably has a shot to win this race. Um, I think he was setting up for the winning move. Um, you look on the last two laps of that race, they finished on the green. Um, Pato was up high and then uh, Newgarden inch you know, ahead. And then Pato 
on the backstretch, fell back in line to uh, right behind him, and he was right in his draft backstretch, getting ready to swing out back to the outside. I think um, you know coming to the white flag, uh, but then of course uh, Grosjean uh, spun out, crashed, so uh, finished under yellow. So um, still though uh, a great race though in my opinion, um, probably yeah one of the b- better Texas races we've seen in a long time, and yeah, hundred percent think it's because of the resin that they used and. Also, you know, they changed the package a little bit on the IndyCar um, for the IRA team. That, you know, put in, uh, I think, I think they put in a little bit more downforce uh, on the cars. So, you know, they they were able to really hang tight on the outside. Um, you know, I read, I guess, the drivers were inspired by Jimmy Johnson last year trying the high line and being able to make it work. And I guess, you know, that gives them. You see, a seven-time guy went in successful texas winner gives them more confidence that um that they are able to do it themselves and so that's what you saw a lot of on sunday is guys taking it three wide and being able to make it work and yeah there was a couple times i you know was pretty nervous about like them going three wide especially going up into the you know former grip strip up there on you know turns one and two and even three and four like you know that traditionally has been a very slick area and it still was you know we saw that with takuma sato early on in the race uh still was a little bit but um you know in the center of the corner um it seemed like as long as you didn't get too far up there it was still somewhat raceable and saw a lot of that throughout the race so yeah a lot of side-by-side action uh throughout of that and that's you know that's what we like to see uh you know in oval racing with indycar and so you like to see especially texas as um, maligned as it is i mean the fact that you know they're still racing there you know don't want to like you know not see a good race so you know, they are able to make it work and we saw you know fairly entertaining race a lot most lead changes for a non indycar race on an oval you know in since uh 2017 so um you know shows you know when the package is right and when they get the track right when they prep it right you know you can have uh good racing and that's what we saw a lot of on sunday and um you know hopefully we see that type of well i mean it's gonna be different at indianapolis of course but you know hopefully they're as competitive as they were here um at indianapolis but yeah overall uh great great weekend of racing for the indy cars and you know as for as much as the lull that we had from uh this race back to st pete now a month ago um yeah they have a lot of momentum uh um if the fact that it was a really good race if it weren't a good race and it was a boring then yeah any car would have lost momentum but now that they have had two really good entertaining races through the start of the season gives them a little bit of momentum in the um pr department and they can use these races as you know more marketing uh for themselves and definitely help grow the fan base and yeah i think Definitely a lot of fans at this Texas race compared to last year and definitely think help improve, uh, you know, later on and, you know, the season and, you know, the future for Texas. Yeah, I think they're going to stay there as it, it sounds like. And uh, I mean, they're they keep on talking about all oh, the rumors about different ovals going to different places. You made a post earlier on your Twitter feed, I, I think. I commented on another person's post last week or during the weekend in regards to other ovals they should be looking at. I mean, it's it's something where Texas Motor Speedway, they're, now they're talking about possibly doing a reconfigure and a repave, which would hurt IndyCar more than NASCAR, really. Um, but considering how crappy the track is, the fact that they actually had a good race is something. So take it for what it is. It's the only oval they'll have prior to the Indianapolis 500 and practice and qualifying the whole bit. So for those who made it through unscathed and actually ran well, that's a, that's a good thing for the ones that didn't, for the likes of uh, Ray Hall, DeFrancesco, Stingray Rob, Rosenquist, Kirkwood, and Sato. I think those all those teams are kind of licking their wounds. I mean, Andretti losing two of their cars, um, the Ray Hall team being complete garbage the whole entire weekend there. Um, that's and then you know, like that's where you, you you have to go back to the drawing board and say, Oh, what happened here? What what can we do? That Catherine Legg doing a refresher earlier today and uh but if I mean, it's a good thing they only have 33 cars, because if there was actually bumping for the Indianapolis 500, I have a feeling that as of now, the Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan team would be on in deep trouble. Um, 
I mean, I think they're going to have to get rid of that stupid bump day thing like they've had the last few years as well. Just, um, you know, the qualifying should be strictly they'll have everyone do their one four lap run for whatever position and then whoever actually is in contention to try to get back into the fast nine or whatever. I think they can even change it instead of having that back row deal. You could just do the fast make it the fast 11. So the first third of the field goes and runs, um, make it a, make it an equal deal. It doesn't sound like an equal number, but it's one third of the field. You get 33 starters. The top third gets to go and have a chance at pull. Um, but I doubt that'll happen. Uh, points as of course, as I mentioned, going to Long Beach here, a uh, couple weeks time, Pato award on, uh, strength of two second place finishes is the points leader takes over the points lead from Marcus Erickson, uh, the St. Pete winner, Scott Dixon, two top five finishes so far this year, puts him in third new gardens win moves him up to fourth, one point behind Dixon. Alex Pillow has finished in the top 10 in both races, same as his teammate Erickson. Um, and he is fifth, so three Ganassi cars in the top five. David Malukas has finished in the top 10 in both races so far and is running is in sixth. So Hondas have, uh, what is it, uh, four out of the top six in points. Callum Eilat, uh, two top uh, top five and two top tens. He is seventh, one point behind Malukas. Scott McLaughlin, eighth, Rossi, ninth, and Will Power rounds out the top 10. Uh, Canapino is at two consecutive 12th place finishes, and he's actually 12th in points. And uh, Colton Erda is just behind Power there, three points behind. So that those are the points. We'll get back to IndyCar for the Acura Grand Prix of Long Beach. As I said, in two weeks, the next order of business is, of course, NASCAR, uh, X in the Cup and the Xfinity series, the Cup series Toyota Owners 400 at Richmond International Raceway. They've taken out the international out of all of the ISC tracks, which is nonsense, but I'll, I always know it as Richmond International Raceway. Um, saw Kyle Larson lead 93 laps, four times for 93 laps. Uh, he's got solid stage points in both stages and was able to fade the likes of William Byron and uh, others late in the race to get his first victory of the 2023 season. Uh, his teammate Josh Berry in the Napa Chevy gets his best career cup series finish in second. Ross Chastain finished third. Christopher Bell fourth. Kevin Harvick with a uh, fifth place finish. Michael McDowell Sixth, Joey Logano, seventh, Alex Bowman, eighth, Keebler Gibbs, ninth, Brad Keselowski, tenth, uh, Martin Truex, who led uh, 56 laps, ended up 11th. Chase Briscoe actually got a stage point there and um, finished 12th, so one of his better finishes of the year. Uh, Al Marola from 32nd finished 13th. Kyle Busch started second but fell back. Uh, Todd Gill, three consecutive top 15 finishes for him, so maybe he's not so bad. But he can't. He doesn't have any money. The only person that was out of the race was Gagson because he hit the wall. Um, otherwise, he. Otherwise, it's uh, yeah. It's a three, yeah, and lap three o. Oh, it says lap three o oh, three, but it says three o oh, seven to three twelve was a caution. I guess he was already lapsed down. Okay, yeah. So that was that. Um, I mean, essentially, the way the strategy had ran and the way things had gone. Early in the first portion of the race, it was William Byron and Denny Hamlin were up there. Then you had uh, Truex after those two guys in the third stage, but tire strategy did not go in his favor late. And the fact that it was a short run versus a long run. Um, but Hendrick has been, the Hendrick cars have been fast all year, and it continues yet again. Uh, with Larson getting his first win of the year. Um, I mean, Bowman getting another top 10 finish, uh, increasing his points lead. Uh, well, I say increasing. I mean, it's only four points, but still, uh, he's still the points leader you know, because of something that took place after we did our show uh, last week. Uh, we'll get into that. You know, I mean, uh, they rescinded the penalty that Hendrick Motorsports, they got rid of the points penalty. They gave him back the points. Kept the fine and the suspension. 
I don't get it. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you take give them the points back but not the other stuff? Why don't you just go and cut the monetary fine down and give them the crew chiefs back? That's my thought. It, it doesn't really matter one way or the other. Hendrick has proven it doesn't matter who their crew chief is. Chad can also get suspended at least once a year, He and Jimmy Johnson still won races. Jeff Gordon would have whatever Latart gets suspended. He still won. I mean, come on. Does it really matter with Hendrick Motorsports? Uh we could go up there and crew chief for Hendrick Motorsports. I mean, I know you'd be you'd do fine, just fine with it, with the computer and all the other technology. So it's really me. I would just be sitting there getting drunk, and I could go and do a Harry Hogg impression, and I could probably eat ice cream, eat, eat ice cream, and we'd still win. You know. So I'm Kyle Larson. Somebody would be working at an ice cream stand or a tilt a world if he couldn't drive a race car. Uh, gets another victory. I think what was his twenty? What is it? His twentieth uh, victory. Cup victory. Year. Yeah. So that's. Uh, it took him a long time to finally get a, his first Cup Series win, and uh, then he started winning. And then, of course, two years ago, he won ten races on his way to his Cup championship. So now Kyle Larson has twenty career Cup Series wins. Uh, nice, solid number, but he's definitely going to keep on doing more with that, Josh. Yeah, of course, you know, Kyle Larson finally winning this year. Of course, um, Phoenix gave that away. Um, and, of course, um, you know, with Las Vegas, they were up there and had a chance to win. But then uh, they, you know, got screwed over by one of the yellows uh, late in that race. Now they finally win here uh, at Richmond. And, yeah, of course, like you said, uh, the crew chiefs doesn't matter. Um, I mean, even though they are suspended, of course, they're communicating remotely, uh, you know, to the teams, you know, through team, Microsoft teams, video chat, whatever. So, um, you know, that's how teams are able to get around those suspensions and everything. So, you know, it's just up, up to the, um, guy in the box to make the strategy calls, but, you know, as far setups and everything like that, you know, the real crew chief can still, uh, contribute a lot, even if they're not physically present at the racetrack uh but yeah it's um uh, interesting on the penalties part yeah i'm not really sure how to agree about you know how the penalty should be levied and of course you know um anonymously a lot of the crew chiefs in the garage there's a report from the athletic um talking about how um you know the comments that you know they made anonymously about the situation and like well this you know just seems like anything goes now uh etc um you know may our they just not going to do anything about these penalties. Um, so yeah, it's uh, pretty interesting there on the penalties, but Hendrick's still doing well regardless. Uh, you know, I mean, I think the most impressive out of those is Josh Berry for sure. Um, you know, he, he's been doing pretty solidly uh, in the cup, but uh, he was up in the top 10, you know, for most of this race, uh, of course got spun out by Ryan Blaney in the middle of it. Uh, so it was a caution, but, you know, he was able to come back and uh, get into the lead on part of the pit cycle and get, you know, lead laps and kind of had a shot to win there at the end, honestly. Like, I thought maybe he might be able to get up there and challenge uh, Kyle Larson for the win, but I think, you know, Larson just had better handling car on fresh tires than uh, Josh Berry did. And I think, you know, the run itself to the checkered flag, um, only 14 laps, which really, unless like you have really good short, handle or you know short run car um you know i think richmond is one of those short tracks that takes several laps really to um really get up there and try to make something happen um so you know i think josh berry very impressive uh second place finish there and honestly if he won i would you know put in a lot of questions if um you know what what do they do now um with him like do it's gonna be like his uh 2021 season where he won a handful of races and then had to like jump between cars to maintain points uh, in the point standings or something like that so that'd be pretty interesting if that had happened but um still yeah very impressive run um of course larson was up there and i think you know i think larson was kind of him winning was very beneficiary of uh what happened to william byron because i honestly thought william byron was going to win this race uh just looking at the standings um you know, he seemed like he had the best handling car all day until the end. He, you know, just, um, I think they just got behind on their pit stop and then, uh, you know, got spun out by Chris Bell, uh, there at the end of the race. So, uh, you know, Byron, I think he had the best car, but they just didn't capitalize. So kind of, kind of the opposite of, you know, what 
has happened to him the last couple of weeks with him being um, still successful. So yeah, we'll see if they're able to um, continue on with uh, their speed. But yeah, Hendrick overall still performing uh, really strongly this first part of the year. Um, and um, of course, not not looking like they're going to slow down anytime soon. And of course, on the incident with Byron and Chris Bell, you know, post race, Chris Bell blaming uh, Ross Chastain uh, for taking them three wide. And I guess Chris Bell got loose and got into Will Byron there. So yeah, I think that's a little little bit of you know too too much. I guess it, it, I think he's maybe going a little bit too hard there on on Ross. I don't think Ross did anything wrong in that situation. Um, I I'm also a believer in you know you got to be able to control your race and be able to race around the other people, not you know the depend on the other people to do do their job and everything. And of course Ross put him three wide, but Chris Bell got loose and then gets into William Byron. I think that's William Byron's fault there, or or Chris Bell's fault there. So um, you know I don't think he needs to just uh, go over the top and just you know start blaming Chastain because he's the easy guy to blame. Um, because of his history and everything. So, um, you know, Chris Bell is still finishing fourth and Chastain third. So they're still, both of them still doing pretty well in this series. And um, surprising finish also for M- Michael McDowell finishing sixth place, uh, getting another, I mean, they finished 11th last week at Coda and now they go to finish uh, sixth place. So um, some of these tracks, yeah, definitely good for the uh, Bob Jenkins organization, front row motorsports and everything. So good result there. BK finishing 10th, also pretty good result there. Truex in 11th, uh, led a bunch of laps and probably could have been up there, but I think he just got, uh, screwed over on the last couple of restarts. And I think probably would have, probably would have won maybe if the race had gone green the rest of the way after he, you know, he took the lead, uh, from, uh, you know, I think 50 laps ago, took the lead from, uh, William Byron uh, late in the race, so um, probably could have happened, but, uh, you know, um, last caution coming out uh, with Tyler Reddick, 20 laps to go, kind of changed everything, and then uh, the stuff with Byron and and Bell, so, yeah, definitely, uh, I mean, not, you know, not a whole lot of, like, wrecks or anything like that, Uh, of course, Hamlin getting into it with uh, J.J. Ailey accidentally, apparently, um, but uh, still a lot of strategy in this race. I um, think the low downforce package uh, definitely showed evidence of it working, but still I think you know the real, only real um, way to improve uh, short track racing is to be able to give them more horsepower, and, you know, which probably won't happen. But still talk of doing the grooved uh, tires thing, uh, which I'm curious to see how that would work out as far as changing the ability of the cars uh, to have grip, mechanical grip, uh, on the racetrack so we'll see how that plays out but yeah i mean not too too much happened but enough happened to say that yeah it was a fairly solid race uh in, in terms of you know the actual racing bit uh at richmond for cup series yeah sorry about that yeah i mean for for hendrick motorsports yeah definitely um was they they it was hendrick and gibbs and and Larson, it's not surprising winning at Richmond for him. It's one of his better racetracks, of course. Barry going out there, he's two best finishes. I've been on the two smallest tracks that they've run during his time in the car. And he's a short track racer at the core. So not so surprising for him. Um, but it's good to see and it kind of and it kind of speaks to his viability um long term uh, in his in his desire to get into a cup at some point and um, learning how to drive this new car and uh, adjust his driving style to that is a, uh, is a solid, uh, solid thing. I, I don't know if it's really helping him in the Xfinity series to be fair, but it's something where you just kind of have to go with the flow and know, um, know that it's uh, I mean, you're, you're, it's a moving target with this car. I'm curious. I would, I definitely would like to see him uh, run this run a car at uh, the all-star race at, at North Wilkesboro, because that would be insane to see him do that. I mean, they're going to run Martinsville uh, next in two weeks time. And that's a track he's one at in an Xfinity car is a track he's one at in a late model. He's, so if they're in Andrick Motorsports, it's attractive one at more than anybody else, I think. So could be the perfect storm there, as Josh was talking about with Barry winning, um, since we don't know when William Clyde Elliott is going to come back yet. 
Not, um, yeah, as it as it stands right now, uh, the overall points leader is Alex Bowman, and he's up by four points on Ross Chastain. Christopher Bell is third, and uh, he the gap from third to to eighth, which is Kyle Busch, is only fourteen points so that's really close there bell byron harvick larson logano kyle bush all of that all but well bell and and harvick haven't won yet this season as in the overall points four out of the top five have not won a race this season but i figure that'll change there's been uh four five six different winners to start the year yeah six different winners in seven races so it's kind of has the same a similar feel to last year when there was 19 different winners in uh, 2022. Uh, Martin Truex, Brad Keselowski round out the top 10. Blaney, Hamlin, Reddick, Sindrick, Busher, and Stenhouse uh, round out the 16. Of course, Stenhouse won the Daytona 500. And, um, oh, Richard, uh, Busher in theory is the bump spot. And he has a six-point lead on Daniel Suarez. And he has an eight-point lead on Michael McDowell. Nine on Corey LaJoy. So Corey LaJoy lost the spot in points after a rough day. Got jumped by McDowell there. Um, that'll be interesting as the season goes on. Gilland having to spend, separate, or go and run three different cars this season. Uh is 23rd in points, so he's ahead of Austin Dillon, A.J. Allmendinger, Al Marola, Priest, amongst others. So that's that. They'll be running on the Bristol Dirt here this Sunday on Easter Sunday. In the Xfinity Series, it was uh, Chandler Smith who uh, had led the most laps in the Toyota Owners, or not Toyota, in the Toyota Care 250, and... Um, he goes out and gets that leads win stage one, led the most laps in the race. It was essentially five drivers had uh, a good amount of the laps led there. Brant, Bruckshot Jones and Riley Herbst were up front most of the day, but then both of them uh, ended up falling back late. Only one car fell out of this race as well. Um, Anthony Alfredo with an accident lap one. 40, 44, it says, but they don't show. You say stage conclusion, stage two conclusion. 98 and 9, yeah, they, the 98 and the 9, so the nine, yeah, they crashed into each other. And, uh, yeah, so I don't know where it says accident, but it doesn't show in the recap. Chandler Smith gets his first career Xfinity Series win over John Hunter Nemechek, Josh Berry, Kaz Grala, and Cole Custer. Sheldon Creed, Ryan Sieg, Parker Kligerman, Austin Hill, and Derek Krause running the 10 for Colleague um, gets in there and finishes 10th. Um, Alex LeBay from 32nd finished 11th. Jeb Burton, 12th. All Geyer started on pole, had issues. Uh, 13th, Chris Hacker in his Xfinity debut finished 14th. And Brian Ellis uh, rounds out the top 15th. The, I mean, the vast majority of the laps, as I said, five drivers. It was Chandler Smith with 83 led, Josh Berry with 63, uh, Sammy Smith with 40 laps, uh, was it Brockshot Jones with 24 led, and Herps with 27 led. And um, it was uh, pretty uh, straightforward in, in the sense that Chandler Smith was able to go and lead, early, lead in the uh, late in that first stage to get the stage win. Then he ended up going out and after that and trading the lead with the likes of uh, Josh Berry and Jones and then John Hunter Nemechek. But in the end, Chandler Smith goes and gets his first career victory, uh, made his Cup Series debut yesterday as well. So um, big weekend for Chandler Smith, solidifies himself in the championship uh, points to get to the playoffs. He's only the fourth driver, regular driver, to win so far this year. Um, three, uh, six races, and that's, uh, yeah, so six of the seven races have been won by Xfinity regulars. Trying to go and see. 
The other one, of course, is A.J. Allmendinger last week at Coda. But, yeah, Chandler Smith goes out there, thanks his smoking hot wife, Josh, and uh, amongst other things he said on his post-race interview. But he's one of the better talents in this sport, and he had unfortunate uh, situation at Daytona trying to make the 500. But he was recovered in a way and made the most out of the situation, and uh, he's a winner in the Xfinity Series. Yeah, he's a winner in the Xfinity Series. You know, Chandler Smith has kind of been a long time coming for him here uh, in just this short season because he had a great run at uh, Las Vegas last month and probably should have won that one, but came up short and finished third. And, you know, he had a three top fives this year as well. So, uh, you know, finally converting that one uh, into a victory here uh, in this race, of course, led a lot, bunch of it early in the race, but he was able to pull through at the end and pulled away from John Hunter and Emichek on the last restart. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was a pretty big win for him, of course, you know, first career win. And definitely, you know, I think he'll be here for a while in the Xfinity series. Um, potentially, you know, I don't know when he'd move up, but, um, I, I definitely think maybe another season in the Xfinity, he'll be right there, up there in uh cup series, but, yeah, he um, definitely had a, a good win. Of course, raced against uh, John Hunter Nemechek, fighting for the win. John Hunter getting a uh, third consecutive uh, finish and second place at Richmond. So uh, just so close once again for uh, John Hunter to get the win. Um, yeah, so, I mean, solid solid racing overall. Um, yeah, I think, you know, John Hunter, um, I mean, he's already won. So, you know, it's, it's okay, I guess. But... Uh, Still needs to be able to convert that one to win at uh, this racetrack. Uh, Josh Berry, of course, you talk, talked about him early. And, you know, I definitely, you know, think he had a lot of um, influence from this run and the Xfinity series and then be able to carry it over into the uh, Cup series, of course. And, you know, he had had a good car, too. He led uh, 63 laps and um, he was out front. Uh, and then a bunch of cautions happened you know, 65 laps ago, uh, started having some more cautions in this race. So definitely, uh, you know, was affected by that. And think if he didn't have, uh, those cautions to worry about, probably could be talking about him uh, as a race winner, of course. And, um, you know, he talked about other guys in the top 10, uh, Kaz Grala. I mean, that's a pretty, pretty good run there as well. Uh, and you actually, I mean, you, you've been pretty solid with the, the picks lately in the Xfinity somehow and uh John Hunter. I mean of course John Hunter didn't win, but he, you know got top five, finished second, Kaz Grala uh you know was your wild card pick as well and you know he finished in fourth so and it's pretty strong effort on their end and everything. So um yeah I mean uh good good race uh in Xfinity on Saturday. Um of course yeah I like like to see new winner in this series and of course um, somebody I think that we expect to be a competitive driver uh, in this series, you know, for, you know, the next year, maybe the next season. So, yeah, definitely a um, good result. And then I think also talk about the top five, the other top five guy that finished uh, Cole Custer. You know, he hasn't had a great start to this season so far in his uh, return to Xfinity series, but you know, finally got a top five here in this race. So definitely a good result. Try to turn things around, which looks like maybe he's on that track. So yeah, definitely a, a solid result for a lot of these, uh, you know, Xfinity regulars here this weekend at Richmond. Yeah, and they take the week off for Easter before they come back at Martinsville in a couple weeks time. And uh, though I think that's a Saturday afternoon race, um, I believe. Let's go back and check it to be to be completely sure. Um, the qualifying, yeah. Oh no, it's a Saturday evening race or Saturday, yeah, Saturday evening race at uh, Martinsville on the fifteenth. Oh, so that's my mom's birthday. Uh, so yep. Yeah, so went through that. There was only one car fill up. Mm-hmm. And we'll get into the points. Uh, Austin Hill, of course, still leads the points. He's 12 points ahead of Riley Herbst, 18 ahead of John Hunter Nemechek. Chandler Smith moves up to fourth. Josh Berry gains four spots in points this week uh, with his solid run and uh, is now fifth in points. Uh, Justin Allgaier, sixth. Sheldon Creed, seventh. Sam Mayer, Sammy Smith. Cole Custer, your top ten. Daniel Hemrick and Parker Kligerman, 
uh, still round out the 12. Uh, Ryan Sieg is 13 points out of the cutoff. And uh, Brockshot Jones is 27. And uh, 39 points back is Parker, or, I mean, Jeb Burton in 15th. So those are the next three people that are in the mix. Kaz Grala moves up to 20th in points with his uh, top five finish. So that's uh, the points right there. We'll reconvene at Martinsville and in a couple Saturdays. Can Austin Hill keep his run going? Can somebody else get uh, a victory? You know, of course, Josh Berry won his first career Xfinity race at, at Martinsville. And, um, you know, Riley Herbst has never won an Xfinity race. He's never won a, he never won a truck race either. So, um, John Hunter you know, driving for Gibbs, they should have good race cars. Same for Sammy Smith, uh, Sheldon Creed still looking for that first Xfinity win, uh, amongst other people there. So that was that at, uh, Richmond will, uh, get into the speedy cash 250 at Texas Motor Speedway now which was essentially um, Nick Sanchez. Started on pole, won both stages, led all but four laps of the race, only to get junked on uh, the final lap there. And, uh, I mean, it's a matter of time for him to actually come through and finally win a race, I think, here in the Truck Series. Um, my pick in in the our picks pool was for me was Grand Infinger, and he finished right behind Nick Sanchez. So take it for what you will on that. Um, Carson Hosevar sends those guys and gets his first win. Chase Purdy gets his best career finish uh, in second. Stuart Friesen, who was my wild card pick, finished third. Ty Majeski fourth. Jake Garcia gets his first career top five finish. Uh, Miss Hummer 2.0. Finished sixth from 25th. Corey Heim seventh. Ryan Vargas from 26th finished eighth. Jack Wood ninth. And Ben Rhodes rounded out the top 10. Uh, there was 15 trucks on the lead lap. Uh, both Zane Smith and Christian Eckes were able to get their trucks rolling and come back to the checkered. Um, they were involved in that last lap incident and uh, gave the that was with uh, help from Josevar and Josevar finally gets his first career truck series victory. And um, I mean, it wasn't surprising uh, when you get to that point for for where Carson Josevar, he's been so close. He wanted to close the deal and he did and he stayed in it and said, oh, I, whatever, whatever it takes. So if I have to clean him out, then I have to clean him out. And that. I made a comment one of the pages or one of the Twitter feeds I follow that, you know, he's learning from his mentor how to win races, and that's how uh, Chastain has kind of set the tone and how he does things. And um, But maybe now Josevar with the pressure off of not winning, finally getting that first win might help Nice Motorsports out in general in building better race trucks as they get towards the playoffs. Uh give Josevar more time to possibly win another race. You know, all this other all those other perks. But you know that um right now I think it, what people have to look at, and I think the real story of the race was Nick Sanchez and his domination, the defending Arca series champion, um five races in, has had a second, uh was basically gonna win this one and uh was qualified on pole I think twice already this year so i mean he's they are fast every week and uh it it speaks to how uh good that effort is even though it's a downsized kyle bush motorsports outfit albeit a run it out of they run it out of rev racing it's named with rev racing but it's a kyle bush motorsports truck and um i mean that's the that's the thing here i mean credit to uh Credit to Carson Osovar for his first career victory. I mean, I guess it wouldn't have happened any other way. He cleaned out somebody to do it. But uh, at that point, it's the final lap of the race. So they say, boys have at it. And that's what he did. Yeah, of course, boys have at it and have a good time, right? No, that's what Robin Pemerton said back in the day in 2010. But, uh, I mean, Nick Sanchez, uh, Zane Smith getting into it, coming on to the final lap. And then Nick Sanchez came back across uh, into the path of Carson Hosevar, and you know Carson didn't lift. You know he just kept it, 
kept it to the floor and kept on going and made contact and kept on going and picked up the win, which I guess that's how you got to do it these days to get your first win uh, somehow. So, um, you know, I think, you know, he's been so close so many times. And I guess, like you said, yeah, he finally just had to do it the way that others have been doing it. Right. So maybe that's how it's going to go, but um, just so many cautions in this race and this, you know, this truck race was uh, a mess, um, you know, similar to how um, people were complaining about the cautions and cup last week at Coda. I mean, there was just so many accidents and things that took place. Um, you know, I mean that last lap wreck, I mean, you can say, yeah, they're fighting for the win and everything, but at the same time, like, I mean, can't really, it's, it's hard to blame the guy for keeping it to the floor, uh, you know, to try to win. Um, you know, you're trying to go for your first win, of course, but on the other end, like all the other stuff that, you know, happened there, um, you know, you had guys crashing off, coming off of turn four, um, one driver, Dean Thompson getting taken, uh, by a stretcher to the hospital ambulance. And then he got released later on and he's okay. And he said he was drinking a beer at home. Uh, but, uh, still, um, issues there, especially I think they said, the spotters there some of these drivers did not have their uh regular spotter in the stands um and i i think some teams even employed some of the indy car spotters to kind of uh assist uh, in, in the effort for this race but um yeah just so many so many cautions throughout uh the end and just really drag out uh things um I mean, there is a uh, 20% of the race run under caution, uh, in this race. And of course, uh, you had 12 cautions for 36 laps. So yeah, definitely a lot of, a lot of stuff happening. Um, you know, you had the last lap incident, of course, which was the caution and project Ruth crashed or had an accident in the back stretch, the big wreck off turn four with Matt Crafton and other drivers. Um, another big crash with Daniel die, um, and other drivers, uh, then the four truck accident that included, uh, Dean Thompson. So yeah, definitely a lot of incidents in this race, especially in the, you know, last 30 laps of this, uh, a lot of things happening. So, um, yeah, I saw, I mean, I didn't really pay attention to it much. I think I was you know, looking at the, uh, basketball game on Saturday, but, um, you know, definitely, uh, not, not the ideal type of race that you want to have, uh, for uh, the truck series and especially with, you know, so many things, cautions, wrecks happening, um, you know, makes it look, you know, very amateurish, which, you know, it's truck series. So I guess it is, but, um, you know, probably dragged out a lot of it that didn't need to be dragged out. Just like what we talked about last week. And of course, um, got a, got a feel for Nick Sanchez. Cause, um, you know, hasn't, hasn't won yet, but, uh, you know, he, has been close. I mean, he's been up front in a lot of these races, of course, been up front, here at texas uh ran up front uh at atlanta you know led laps at las vegas as well so he's been up there he just hasn't been able to convert it into a win you know led 168 laps texas and ends up you know on the back back hook of a tow truck uh so nothing to show for that effort there but yeah definitely a unfortunate situation there and um just a you know uh bad bad race you know typical of trucks at texas and uh thankfully at least the tire compound did not affect the indy car race there the next day so um we'll just have to live with it and move on but yeah just a you know typical truck race overall that we've seen the last couple of years yeah definitely with uh and goes into the whole lack of respect as you mentioned deal um i mean hamlin went and used up jj ailey yesterday i mean proving once again his own hypocrisy in that sense. Um, I was trying, I forget what I was, I had a thought and I forgot it, but for the trucks, I mean, that, I mean, that, that race was kind of a bore and it, like, and it, it's, it, I guess they need a grip. It's why they had the grip strip out there. That would might've been a better race and less wrecking, but uh, that's part of it. I mean, the Dean Thompson, that's what it was. The Dean Thompson wreck was complete cluster because, uh, yeah, sure. He he was swapped ends. He got loose. There was issues. He was having essentially the best race of his career, and then he wipe. He hits the right side on the wall coming out of four, and he spins out. But then you have Armani. Will you have spent? But it's not Spencer. Yeah, Spencer or no, not Spencer Void. Matt Mills. Arca braked into him, 
And then Armani Williams and Trey Hutchins went and added in and Arca braked into that crash too. So Thompson usually is one that causes is a is an a caution uh because of sucking. In this case he was a caution because of overdriving and then paid the price for all those hits, getting hit on both sides of the truck and uh, destroying that thing. But at least he's all right. That's good. Uh, if I'm any of those drivers or their, their crew chiefs or their spotters that hit them, I mean, you're in the back of the field and the yellow is out. Like how the, I get that there's smoke and whatever, but there's, you should be running at a lower rate of speed. Uh, you're coming in full bore and you're going to go and nail a stationary vehicle. It's not going to be good. But it fits the like what you said about the amateurish nature of the driving, um, and that's where the this is it's there's been a regression in the driving talent and standard in all of NASCAR's major series, and then you add it in ARCA as well. So I I mean you're right, you can't be surprised at this point with the way they drive. Um, just means more equipment's going to get destroyed. Uh, the points going to the Bristol Dirt Race uh, sees Ty Majeski uh, can uh, take over the points lead from Zane Smith by three. And uh, Ben Rhodes, Christian Eckes, Matt Crafton round out the top five. And Finger falls in Crafton swap spots. And Finger is sixth now. Chase Purdy moves into the top ten. In seventh, Corey Heim eighth, Nick Sanchez ninth. Even with the falling out late, Tyler Ankrum is tenth overall in points, but would be, what is it, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine. Corey Heim would actually be the cutoff. Uh, Purdy and Heim would be the cutoff for the playoffs right now. Sanchez is nine points back, and Ankrum is uh, 20. Um, Twenty three points back. Yeah, that's what it looks. Yeah, twenty three points back. And then um, I'm in Josevar there. He's in. So now those are truck points, and uh, got a wild card at Bristol Dirt coming up. Formula One ran at uh, the Australian Grand Prix, and uh, it wasn't uh, straightforward for Max Verstappen initially in the race, but once he got clean air and track position. It was all she wrote, plus, of course, Formula One and their infinite wisdom through three different red flags uh, during the race and just caused more chaos after those red flags. Um, yeah, the Albon incident was not was definitely not good, especially in uh, rolling back in the traffic and uh, Nico Hulkenberg being quoted as saying he had a code brown moment uh, driving by uh, the... Albon Williams, they red flagged it because of sand being on the track. And I don't know, they didn't give an explanation for why they had the red flag. And then they ended up having three. Um, and it looked, it looked pretty uh, bleak in that sense. Um, there was also, um, there was a in track invasion. So early in the race. So, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of cluster F actions that were going on at uh, Melbourne this past weekend, but in the end, the same result as we have seen um, for most of the last year plus in in Formula One, Fish Lips getting another victory, Lewis Hamilton benefiting from staying out while they had given George Russell, who had taken the lead on the start, a choice of strategy. He goes and makes a change to hard tires to go long, and soon after that, that was reaction to Alex Albon's incident and then coming out of the pits and driving around for a few corners, they red flag the race, which goes to something that I um, despise greatly is the way that they have the red red flag procedures um, in formula one. You can essentially rebuild the car within, you know, whatever parameters you can touch. Um, if there's enough time, you can put new tires on You're taking away the strategy aspect of it which to me that's half of what makes that's a big part of what makes formula one have its allure is that strategy thing now because they don't have fuel you don't do fueling you only have the tires it's maybe tire strategy but usually everybody goes on the same one uh, by the end of the race to limit the amount of pit stops um trying to go and get the get the results for 
for the Australian Grand Prix. Uh, the Rolex Australian Grand Prix. Red Bulls uh, Verstappen wins by less than two tenths over Sir Lewis Hamilton. Alonso's third, third and fourth for both Aston Martins. Sergio Perez from uh, tailback goes and finishes fifth. Lando Norris is sixth and Oscar Piastri in his home race eighth. So McLaren gets double points. They're off their duck early in the season. Nico Hulkenberg seventh and Joe Guan Yu ninth and Yuki Tsunoda tenth. Um, there are only 12 cars classified at the uh, end of the race. Um, so there was because of some of the incidents and stuff that went on. Logan Sargent ended up finishing 16th just behind his fellow rookie, Nick DeVries from, uh, the Alpha Tori team. So there's, um, there's that Charles Leclerc, uh, got spun out, I think on lap two or of the race. So his nightmare of a season continues and, um, just trying to go and make the most out of the situation. I mean, you got, yeah, Leclerc. And I'm trying to look for, yeah, Signs ended up finishing dead last of the drivers that are on the track in 12th. Uh, that, it's been a really bad start to the year for Ferrari. But on the flip side, uh, Verstappen continues to have control and um, basically dictate how things are going to go in regards to himself and uh, uh, what he's looking for for another world championship this year, Josh. Yeah, I think, you know, this race here i mean proves for stopping still has what it takes um you know to win the championship with his pace uh that he had throughout the race um uh, i mean for you talked about ferrari um i mean i i was very intrigued by uh carlos Sainz. um he had a lot of a lot of good pace uh throughout you know throughout the entire event you know up until the very end um and he'd gotten up into fourth uh, place and I really, really thought that he might be able to challenge Alonso for uh, top three, but he just wasn't able to get up there really. And um, once he got up to fourth, I think his momentum and um, his pace kind of leveled out compared to you know Alonso and Hamilton. Uh, so you know, I thought I thought they'd be able to make something of that, and then of course um, gets penalized for the last. Um, you know, wreck with Alonso getting into Alonso on the last restart, uh, which, you know, of course proves, um, you know, you got a bunch of, you know, drivers, the entire field on, onto a narrow track, uh, you know, you get, um, a bunch of guys like that and then they're bound to have an accident um which ended up happening in a very big accident because not only did Alonso spin out, but, um, the Alpine cars took themselves out, uh, and then Lance Stroll, uh, finished or well he ran ran uh, off the racetrack and spun out too so um yeah that that was a very uh interesting finish there of course you know with all the red flag stuff um the red flags definitely not sure how much of those were necessary i think you know, obviously the first one and the second one probably not necessary and then of course the third one was necessary but that's because well he had a giant accident at the end so um not able to uh you know finish everything uh you know on the right conditions but yeah i mean this was a very controversial race because of the red flags um and i think you know with that and also you know some of the safety cars and things that happened in this race you know with the wild restarts at the end um kind of leaves you with the same feeling you know we talked about the trucks earlier and and then talk about cup at coda last week kind of makes you feel like uh the same thing and i think you know jensen button was on the broadcast uh gunther of course back from coda and everything you know jensen and him both at coda one racing and the other in the broadcast and you know now gunther back on the pit box for uh haas makes him feel like that oh maybe we didn't really leave texas and we're still in texas and maybe you can argue that Australia is just like the Australian Texas, I guess. Um, but maybe maybe they felt like they're still uh, NASCAR in Texas because it definitely had a lot of similarities there uh, at, at the end. But um, yeah, I mean, the red flag with Alex Albon, probably not necessary, even though there's a lot of gravel. Um, yeah, I think maybe you can just make that a four, full course yellow. And I think, you know, with four course yellow, you can just um, go clean up the track while well, you know half the field is on the other end clean it up and move on and tow him away um i think 
you know, you don't have to red flag the entire field and start over. I don't think it's necessary. Um, definitely think um, that wasn't necessary. And then the second uh, yellow or red flag uh, for Magnuson or no, for Hulkenberg uh, losing a tire or no, Magnuson losing a tire and then um, the tire falling off and basically getting stuck on the racetrack. Um, don't think that was necessary. Um, again, I think probably a, a full Coors Yellow for that and, you know, just move on uh, and clean it up and move on. You don't have to red flag the race. And I think the driver's opinions kind of affected that based on how surprised some of them were that they would, you know, red flag for what happened to Magnuson and it only leads to what happened on the final restart of the race, uh, you know, final green restart of the race, I should say. Uh, so, you know, it's a definitely a um, controversial way uh, to end the race. And, of course, the most red flags that we've had in uh, F1 uh, race. So uh, definitely uh, not good there. Um, and definitely think that they're taking advantage of the opportunity of red flag for, you know, the standing start again and having a, a having, you know, a manipulated finish uh, kind of feels like NASCAR kind of feels like how they do it in the state side. Um, so got a question, um, the motivation for the uh, red flags from the race control there. Um, but yeah, this, this uh, definitely had a lot in this race. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, science, of course, the pace that he had thought he would be able to challenge for a podium. Well, uh, Sergio Perez also had a lot of pace uh, started from the pits, of course, uh, from the garage and everything, but still came back to take fifth place. He had a lot of pace. He was passing guys throughout the field, uh, throughout the race. Uh, of course, Alonso was really good, and I thought maybe he would be able to overtake Hamilton for second. Uh, but uh, you know, Hamilton was able to hold him off there uh, and keep the gap. You know, throughout the um, event, I think throughout the race, he was able to keep it from not getting closer than a second uh, to him. So you know, credit to Hamilton for protecting uh when he needed to um and being able to uh finish second there of course teammate george russell getting kind of screwed over by the red flag and the uh strategy that they gave him uh versus his teammate there so um yeah that's a wild grand prix of course um and not not the wild that we'd have expected um just a lot of controversy and uh, things like that that uh, we don't really want to see uh, that kind of mar the race and take away from it. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a, a lot that happened and kind of crazy, you know, for F1 drivers, you know, to red flag three times and then, you know, you get out of the car and relax and then all of a sudden you got to go back into it and everything. And then, um, you know, you got to get your focus level back into, you know, back into place. So, um, yeah, glad, glad that uh, I guess that, um, you know, the guys that, you know, the last yellow, they didn't get screwed over by the running order. And then even that caused confusion. Um, of course, Alonzo Stroll both gaining back their position based on them not being able to complete uh, one sector uh, after the restart and everything. So um, at least they kind of get retribution for that, I guess. But at the same time, just a lot that happened that was probably unnecessary. So, um yeah, definitely a wild one, and you know, hopefully the next one uh, isn't quite as controversial as this one was. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, there's stuff on motorsport.com about the their race and uh, some of the things that have to be um, looked at for not only the way they run um, uh, run the, the race uh, differently and manage, but... Um, yeah, so there was definitely issues there. Yeah, right, issues with the red flags, which affected the race penalty on Carlos signs that left him finishing last on the road instead of being on the po being in podium contention like you're talking about. And I mean, it's I mean they are American owned and they're taking a lot of cues from NASCAR and. Those aren't good ones, uh, to say the least. They're gonna they they have a lot to think about, and a lot to adjust, and they have time because they won't be racing until the end of the month because there's no race between the Australian Grand Prix and Baku because the Chinese Grand Prix disappeared yet again. So they'll have time to get into all of that. Uh, so I'm trying to look through all of that. So 
yeah, so that is it for the race, uh, the Australian Grand Prix, as I mentioned. I mean, Lewis Hamilton getting that podium. Um, also, I mean, to get his first podium of the year, Russell taking the lead at the start and Hamilton passing Verstappen, Verstappen crying wolf about being raced hard. What a shock um, by the black guy because he can't take it. Um, but Lewis Hamilton ended up going out there and staying up there, holding off Alonzo. Um, he got past like he was standing still by Verstappen, but was able to hold off Alonzo. Getting that second place finish is great momentum going into this break. Uh, the car is still not amazing, but they've been getting better with it slowly but surely. Uh, once they get the new upgrade at Baku, I'm sure the Mercedes will look more like the vast majority of the rest of the cars on the grid. Um, we'll see how close it is to the Red Bull in terms of a uh, side pod design and some of the other things. But then what will Mercedes, how will Mercedes factor in at that point? I mean, Russell had a chance to get his second career victory. And then not only did he lose that because of the whole first red flag situation, but then his engine blew up. So that was uh, unfortunate for him. I mean, Leclerc continues to have terrible luck and Ferrari's luck this year. People want to talk about last year when they were crashing out of races and giving away things and and qualifying and all that. And then they couldn't hold off or get, get back to Verstappen and Red Bull. Well, now they don't even have that issue because they can't even finish races and they have other things that they're they're doing that are you know went for a team of ferrari's caliber to be doing making these errors and having these problems all the time it's it's not a good look for them and for science and for it's what might have been for leclerc he only ran a lap so it's not like we really know what he would have been able to do in that race uh either way uh the uh, point standings as we wait a few weeks to get uh, racing at Baku for stop in with two wins in a second leads the points by 15 over Perez. Um, then, um, uh, yeah, 15 over Perez as the first, the second, first and fifth Fernando Alonso with three consecutive third place finishes is third in points. And, um, Lewis Hamilton's fourth, two fifths and a second Carlos signs fifth, uh, Stroll, Russell, Norris, Hulkenberg, and Leclerc in 10th. Uh, what is it? Uh, Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri both scoring points for the first time this year for McLaren, which has been a rough year. Um, Josh brought up the Perez uh, start in pit lane for the issues he's had um, with the power unit or other things. And um, so, I mean, credit to him, but he can't have those issues every week and think that they're going to be able to fade it once some of these other teams kind of start coming around with their upgrades and uh, trying to get pace back that uh, um, that Red Bull has had for a while now, uh, essentially since 2021. The All right, so let's get into roundup time. Formula 2 race at Albert Park for the first time ever. Uh, the uh, sprint race results saw Dennis Hauger get the victory over uh, Jack Crawford, the American, Kush Miney, the Indian driver, uh, Artur Leclerc and Zane Maloney round out the top five, Hadjar, Bierman, Vesti, Nassani, and Vashor uh, round out the top ten. And there's some real furniture movers, Nassani, Cordial, uh, Jay Anderuvla had issues, finished 17th. Pocher crashed um, and finished last in that first race. In a sprint race in the feature race, Ayumu Iwasa gets another his second victory of the year. Pocher goes and flips from dead last to second, under a second behind. Arthur Leclerc uh, rounds out the podium, so Dams takes first and third. Vesti Maloney uh, top five, Deruvula sixth, uh, Vashor, Duin, and Kushmini, uh, or Duin, Kushmini, and Juan Manuel Correa, uh, round out the top 10. Um, Hauger ends up falling out of the, the feature race, so that's uh, something there. The standings heading to Baku here, uh, 
in four weeks' time. Owasa retakes the points lead, 58 with 58 points over Pochair's 50. Frederick Vesti uh, scored in four consecutive uh, races. Uh, didn't score anything at Sakir, but has scored points in both Jeddah and Australia in both in both uh, uh, sprint and feature. Uh, Beauchamp third and tied with Artur Leclerc. Deruvula is a point behind in sixth. Hauger is three points behind in seventh. Maloney uh, four points in eighth. Cushmine and Richard Vaishur round out the top ten. Now, um, Jack Dewin is in that mix, too, because he's only, what, five points behind Maloney and six behind Hauger, eight, not, yeah, eight, nine, yeah. So it's very close, essentially, from fourth all the way to 11th right now in the points. So something to look at um, once they kind of get going again. They're going to be really busy uh, after Baku. Once they get to Imola, they're going to be racing um, three weeks in a row. And then the, with Imola, Monte Carlo, and Bar- Barcelona. And then they'll take a month off before they play or drive at, uh, at Spielberg. And they have back-to-back Spielberg and then Silverstone um, before they run out the last part of the season there. Um, Formula 3 ran there as well for the first time. The results in Melbourne, um, the sprint race... Uh, saw uh, Zach O'Sullivan, the Williams uh, development driver, getting a win over Sebastian Montoya. Paul Aaron third, Meany fourth, Beganovic fifth. Uh, let's see, saw so secret man. Kalen Frederick uh, finished tenth. Um, Bill Gomez or Brian. Yeah. So Hunter Yeeney finished twenty second. Uh, so there is that in. Um, the feature race, Bortoletto or Trident gets a win over Gregoire Saucy and Mini. For, for Nioli is fourth, O'Sullivan fifth. Aaron, Marty, Browning, Barnard, and Christian Mansell round out your top ten. Uh, the standings uh, before they go back to Imola. I uh, have even longer break than uh, Formula 2. Bortoletto has a 20-point lead on Saucy. Um, yeah, 20 point lead and a 30 point lead on uh, Beganovic and Mini. So, um, and then Marty fifth, uh, Goth, Aaron, Zach O'Sullivan with his solid weekend moves up to eighth, and um, Fornioli ninth, Browning tenth, Montoya um, is 11th, yeah, Kalen Frederick is 14th in points, and trying to see, there's a bunch of drivers that have not. Score points at all this year, but then it's only two races in, so kind of hard to go and get that wound up about it. So that's it for Formula Three. In uh, next thing we will do is supercars at uh, at Albert Park as well. Uh, it was a Red Bull Triple Eight uh, benefit. Um, while other people had were fast in practice, and then you know it was Shane Van Gisbergen who won the first race, and uh, Brody Kostecki ended up going and taking wins in races four and five, and then Van Gisbergen's uh, Red Bull teammate, Chevy Camaro teammate, Brock Feeney, won race six. So four races they had over the weekend, different differing lengths. Um, the point standings with their a long break for them is Brody Kostecki leading the points, by 32 over Chaz Moster, Shane Van Gisberg, and even with the penalty, he uh, got in the first Grand Prix of the year as third, Andre Heimgardner fourth, Will Brown fifth, and Cam Waters, Brock Feeney just behind those guys in sixth and seventh. You got Reynolds, LeBrock, and right forward. Uh, the best uh, Dick Johnson car is 11th with Will Davidson. Anton Di Pasquale is 18th. So it tells you how bad things are this year uh, for them. And Erebus leads the team's championship by 101 points over Red Bull, and then it's basically out of reach otherwise. Um, I'm trying to think who Erebus runs these days. Uh, Yeah, so I'm trying to think if they're up there, then it 
means, yeah, that's the Coca-Cola cars. That's why both Coca-Cola cars are in the top five in points. That's why. All right. Uh, Next will be MotoGP and Moto2 in Argentina this past weekend. Um, Trying to go into uh, bikes. Darko expected a chance to win in wet. Argentina, right? Uh, let me go and get into that. Uh, G-H. Results. The results of the Argentinian Grand Prix. Marco Bisecchi gets his first career Grand Prix victory in wet conditions, leading a Ducati uh, podium sweep amongst three different teams. Bisecchi gets the win for VR46 team. Over Johan Zarco in second and Alex Marquez in third. Franco Morbidelli ends up finishing fourth. Jorge Martin fifth, giving Ducati four out of the top five. Jack Miller sixth. Fabio Quattraro seventh. Luca Marini eighth. Alex Rins ninth. And Fabio Di Antonio uh, in tenth. Um, Brad Binder and Pecco Bagnaia both fell out of or fell during the race and were affected um, by the end. Uh, of the round with issues um they only had 17 bikes at this race because of a lot of the withdrawals because the injuries suffered earlier in the weekend uh two weeks time between uh there this race in argentina and the race at circuit of the americas the americas Grand prix uh trying to get into moto two and see what's going on or moto two f2 uh Trying to get into that. Full Moto 2 Moto 3 results. I'll show you some. Gardeners, yeah. That's um, to reload that. Trying to see if I can actually get something there. Obviously cannot. So Moto 2 uh, shortened race because of rain. Tony Arbolino wins in um, in the uh, Moto 2 race um, over Alonzo Lopez. Jake Dixon rounds out the podium. Kinnett, Garcia, Darren Binder, Salik, Chantra, Arenas, and Lowe's uh, top 10. Joe Roberts ended up finishing 14th. Uh, Sean Dillon Kelly uh, only lasted one lap and fell out on a crash, probably. Unfortunate for him there at uh, uh, in the Moto2 race because of the wet conditions. NHRA was at Pomona this past weekend. Uh, for the Winter Nationals, which saw um, Justin Ashley win in Top Fuel, uh, Matt Hagen winning in Funny Car again, uh, second time this year, Dallas Glenn uh, wins in Pro Stock, Joey Severance in Top Alcohol Dragster, Tony Stewart ended up racing um, this weekend and went didn't have a great qualifying run, but ended up uh, winning a round of racing. Uh, We'll go backwards here for Pro Stock. Uh, Glenn and Dallas Glenn ends up getting the victory in Pro Stock. Uh, and now, let's see. He ends up going and beating Matt Hartford. Um, was a slower reaction time, but not by much. And by 60 feet, was still in Hartford's favor. But after that, every increment is in the favor of Dallas Glenn. To finish with a 6.54, the 6.209.92 miles an hour to get the victory in this race. In um, in yeah, top fuel, Austin Proc and Justin Ashley, both uh, second generation or even more or later generation in case of Proc. Uh, Justin Ashley gets the victory. Trees Proc has he was slower to 60 foot, but then started gaining back after that. Ran 371 with a 3, 330.63 miles an hour. In Funny Car, Matt Hagen gets, uh, defeats Ron Caps, defending world champion. Gets a really big gap on the tree and then issues for Caps' is Napa Toyota. Uh, he shuts the thing down. Uh, Matt Hagen ends up uh, 396 with a 7, 328.06 miles an hour in Funny Car. Um the latter for you know, can't show that. Uh, trying to see in top alcohol dragster. Uh, Tony Stewart ended up qualifying 13th and uh, ended up going and getting a round win in um, in uh, 
top in top alcohol. Uh, Joey Severance, the winner there in that race. Yeah, to- Tony Stewart had a much better reaction time, uh, slower to sixty, but ended up getting ahead after at three thirty and beyond. Uh, Madison Payne shot it off, uh, unfortunately, to go and see a, a competitive run. But uh, Tony Stewart's five twenty nine with a one two seventy two point five six miles an hour. That's round one. In round two, I worked with uh, Ron Anderson, who ended, who then prom- promptly after helping uh, or helping out goes and gets a victory over Tony Stewart, knocks him out in the seven, se- second round. So we're making progress there. So it's all you can ask for um, from Smoke in a brand new endeavor that he's embarking on here for his career. So let's uh, get into uh, the Bristol Dirt Race. We'll start with the trucks, Josh. Uh, They have a deeper field than usual. Uh, 41 trucks for 36 spots. Two G2G pieces of crap are going to be out there this weekend. Um, uh, What is it? A fourth uh, Nice truck was going to be entered, but they uh, went and withdrew. Some of the cup drivers that are going to be in this race are, are special, like people who are in other disciplines and coming over. Jonathan Davenport, the late the late model uh, champion on dirt uh, for a few years now. He's been a, a championship favorite, winning a lot of races. He's going to run double duty, running in the truck for Spire, who failed to qualify at uh, Texas, or, or I mean, at uh who failed to qualify the seven truck failed to qualify a coda last week because of a tire issue. Then um, Chase Briscoe is going to be in the 22 for AM racing with production Alliance group on the side and trying to see who else or some other, I guess, special there. Uh, Willie Byard will be the 51 for Kyle Busch motorsports. And um, what is it? Stuart Friesen up coming off of a great run at Texas um, brings his wife back out uh, to run in the 62 truck. And then Joey Logano uh, will be running a Thor Sport Racing number 66 Ford there. So, Josh, uh, floor is yours. Who do you look at as uh, your choice to win on Saturday night and, uh, I guess, a wild card as well for the uh, Bristol Dirt? Well, I'm, I'm going to look at a cup guy here, um, I think. Joey Logano comes out and wins the Bristol dirt truck race on Saturday night. Um, I mean, there's a lot of good entries here. Um, you know, you've got guys that are coming from outside the series besides, uh, you know, besides the cup guys. Um, so it's kind of like the Coda, how Coda ha- attracted a lot of road course specialists here, you know, this track, um, in this configuration, you know, it attracts a lot of the dirt guys from around to try to, you know, compete in this and in you know, cup race on Sunday. Uh, but I'm going to go with, you know, Joey Logano. He, um, I, I think, uh, you know, in a, a Thor sport, you know, Ford truck, you know, he's definitely, um, going to be a competitive favorite here, uh, in, in the truck race, uh, wild card, um, you know, wild card for me. Um, you know, I'm I'm gonna go with uh, uh, damn. This is there's a lot of, a lot of guys you can pick here for this. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm gonna go with uh, mm, this is tough. Uh, I Tyler Ingram count as a wild card in this. That's that's who I feel like picking for for uh, this. Isn't he tenth in points? Is he tenth in uh, points now? Uh, something like that. Uh, let me see. He is 10th in points. So I'm trying to look here. So the first four 21 drivers who have run uh, the run the first five, all five races of the season. I think you can, I think after Carson Hosevar, the cutoff is after Carson Hosevar, to be fair. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, I can amend, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. I mean, the driver points like you said after after Hosevar and yeah, anchor him. Um I mean if we want to go for a full time guy, then I don't know. I suppose I suppose they could pick um like Stuart I mean Stuart Friesen, I'm he's he could be a wild card 
he's 13th in points, but I mean, he's a dirt guy. Uh, you could pick him, but you know what? I'll just go with the Spire car. I pick Jonathan Davenport. That's officially, officially what I pick as a wild card. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, it's a good idea because actually, you've now, uh, I'm now I'm all of a sudden becoming a person who picks Stewball. Uh, he's still out of that, um, or out of the, he's on the second half. So he's going to be my uh, wild card pick. My race winner will be, um, I, I could go Homer and say Chase Briscoe. I mean, he's run well in the trucks on the dirt uh, at every time, whether it was Eldora or it was at, uh, at the Knoxville the one year. Uh, there's he's and a lot of people are looking at him as a favorite for the cup series race because of his uh, performance from last year, but I'm going to go and take, uh, William Byron, uh, because he's in the 51 truck. He has tons of momentum going on this year. He's feeling good. Um, and, um, so I think, uh, uh, he's a, a likely person to go and get that win, get that momentum going into Sunday's race and trying to go and get yet another win early in this um, 2023 season. Uh, The cup race, the Food City Dirt Race at Bristol, takes place 37 uh, cars for 40 spots. Uh, The Barry, of course, will be back again in the nine. Uh, Other than that, Jonathan Davenport, the aforementioned, will be making his Cup Series debut this weekend in a Nutrien Ag Solutions number 13 Chevy. Uh, trying to see uh, Brez Tree, Ad Van Elt on the one, uh, Brez Tree on the three, a Bush Light back on Harvick's car, Kings Hawaiian for Brad Keselowski, Nations Guard for Corey LaJoy, uh, Cheddar's Scra- Scratch Kitchen for J- Kyle Bush, um, Josh Perry will be driving the Hooters car, which is uh, pretty cool. And uh, even though the paint scheme isn't, um, Danny Hamlin back in a FedEx car again uh, after I don't know how many weeks of not being in one. And uh, Briscoe will be in the Magical Vacation Planner uh, number 14. Uh, Almendinger and Haley have gain and tide respectively on their cars. So that's interesting uh, sponsorship. Uh, activation uh, Butcher back in Fastenal Auto Owners Insurance for Truex, DeWalt Power Stack for Christopher Bell Dex Imaging for Harrison Burton in 21 uh, let's see some of these other ones uh, Speedy Cash for 38 of Todd Gillen um, Sun Seeker Resort for Noah Gregson and then um, Eric Jones in the Club Wyndham 43, Sirius XM for Tyler Reddick, um, Irish Spring for o Richard, and Keebler is going to have the Interstate ba- Batteries car, um, Ty Dillon, Ferris Commercial Mowers, BJ McLeod Gunk, and then J- J- Jockey will be on Daniel Suarez's on uh, number 99. So um, this one's kind of, is pretty uh, difficult. There isn't a whole lot of data. It's only a couple of years racing on the dirt at Bristol. And so to go and quantify what's um, going on there, um, yeah, two races there. Um, Logano won the first year. Kyle Busch won the second year or last year because um, Chase Briscoe tried to pass for the win and instead cleaned out Tyler Reddick. Um, so that wasn't great. And um, after Reddick had led, 99 laps, I think, of last year's race. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, Briscoe led 59 laps. Average finish of 21st. Oh, man. Yeah, as it stands right now, the av- average finisher. <clears throat> oh, boy. Um, For me, I'm going to go and pick Tyler Reddick. He's got the experience on dirt. Uh, he's free rolling now uh, with the win at Coda. Um. Just want to get more, you want to get more bonus points. You want to get those playoff points. And it's a perfect opportunity for him at a track that he's definitely one of the likely favorites at. I picked Tyler Reddick for that one and uh, trying to go through the driver points uh, standings here at, at, uh, for coming into 
Richmond, I mean, Bristol, sorry. Um, you got 33 drivers or 32 drivers that have run every race, or 33 drivers that have run every race. Justin Haley now has gotten back in a positive point uh, for last week. Uh, I picked uh, Tyler Reddick, and you know what? It's it's out there because if you talk about, what is it, the top 16, essentially, um, I'm going to pick Chase Briscoe. Uh, guy's a dirt racer at the core. He's a, he's a USAC guy. It's an opportunity race for him um, to go and kind of switch the narrative of what this early season has been for him, go and get a win, stabilize their situation, and... Um, give themselves a chance to get out of this rut um, that they've been in all year. Uh, so as I time my picks, Josh, um, floor is yours uh, for your picks uh, at Bristol Dirt. Yeah, I've, I've got, um, you know, I'm going to go with Alex Bowman, Bowman the showman winning uh, on Sunday here at Bristol Dirt. You know, he's a dirt guy too. He's been racing midgets for a bit and, you know, he's got, his effort, you know, at the Chili Bowl and uh, whatnot. Of course, um, you know, there's a little bit where he, he um, raced the 55 Ally Dirt Car, and of course, Jimmy Johnson last year um, tested um, a private test, I think, at Millbridge Speedway last last fall. Of course, uh, it's about the time where Bowman got his concussion and had to skip a couple of races or three races because of that. But uh, you know, he's been quietly running really well, and I think he is good enough on dirt and has a good enough car uh, behind him to um, be able to win. Uh, so I'm going to go with him. Um, you know, he's ran in the top 10 every race, but one race uh, that was at Atlanta this year. So um, I think he finally breaks through in the win column and maybe opens it up in the point standings. Um, wild card for me. Um, I mean, I'm I'm going to go with uh i'm gonna go with uh justin haley wild card um i think you know it's this kind of really on sentiment i guess i mean we can go look at his statistics really quickly here and see but you know i think he's a solid finisher uh in general um in the uh in the cup series uh let's see 2022 bristol dirt for him finished in 14th so uh yeah that's a Fairly good result in 21 when they ran it the first time. Uh, he didn't run it, so he only ran last year, Dirt Bristol. But you know, I think Justin Haley can potentially pull off a you know top 15 finish, like your pick with Chase Briscoe. You know, you're justifying it by the technicality. But hey, it's a high floor, so and he's a dirt guy anyways. So um, gotta uh, gotta take that one. So yeah, definitely respect the pick there. Um, but yeah, uh, it should be an interesting race. Um, personally, I'm not really a fan of the, um, dirt Bristol anymore. I think it was okay. Like the first year that they ran it, but I feel like now it's just overblown and also, um, kind of the, you know, switch from dirt to back to concrete, I think is maybe not, you know, it's not an efficient thing. And, and also, um, I think it's probably a, messing up the track surface um like over time i mean it was okay the bristol's been fairly decent the last couple of years uh on pavement but i think over time um might damage the pavement having to continuously you know put dirt on top of concrete and then take it off put it off and off and again so um not really a fan of that and i think there's probably better use um of course you know they talked about potentially making north wilkesboro a dirt track which um they're i think they're not going to do that because obviously you know racetrack revival happened last year and of course i'm wearing the north wilkesboro right now so um definitely out of the cards there but i feel like you know it'd be better off if cup went actually went to a legitimate dirt track like you know eldora or even um knoxville although that hasn't really worked out for uh the truck series uh lately so i feel like you know one of the more shorter you know circular dirt tracks probably works works out better uh for uh you know for cup series where you know they're not really designed uh to run on dirt and they're having to make you know heavy modifications to be able to make it happen and everything so we'll see how that goes and of course um yeah we'll, we'll see how you know the car handles this year, Bristol dirt and everything, but yeah, um, should be a, should be an interesting race for sure. Yeah, definitely be on Easter Sunday. They'll do the heat races on, um, 
on Saturday, weather permitting, uh, considering they're not there, the Tennessee and, of course, the Masters in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, there is weather issues expected for the Masters every day of the tournament, so that it falls in line with the whole weekend at Bristol, which I think starts on Friday night with the trucks coming in and then having to do all their stuff on Saturday before going and racing on Sunday. It'll be a very condensed schedule and everything will be, um, it'll be asking a lot, even if everything was dry. We'll see what happens. That We'll come back next week and let you know what happened. Um, but it's time for your uh, sim segment, Josh. Let us know about your exploits on uh, I racing, along with other stuff that's going on in regard to sim racing. Yeah, of course. I mean, obviously, uh, stream the uh, Cup Gen Four car race at uh, Charlotte's uh, Motor Speedway. You know, on uh, Friday night, so ran that. Um, ran pretty well. I mean, of course, finished second. Uh, finished, uh, you know, top five, top three, and everything. And uh, I mean, started. I think top 15 so made my way up through the field uh of course a lot of yellows happened and stuff pit strategy tried to save on tires throughout it um and conserve and then you know was able to get into the top 10 uh that way by staying out rather than taking tire tires early and everything um of course towards the end uh was up in uh i think sixth place and then uh i think the leader uh ended up spinning the tires lost the lead and then was just like all over the place from basically from the start finish line all the way through turn two at charlotte and um just trying to uh make up for spinning the tires and you know losing position and then ended up spinning out and everything and i barely got into the back of him trying to avoid him and everything so it took a little count of damage there uh but uh still was able to get through that and, and eventually you know some other guys ended up uh spinning out in front of me as well on, off of restarts we had a lot of cautions and everything um but um ended up getting up to second uh getting sniffing the lead but never really getting able to really challenge for it i think um restarts are really tough uh especially on worn tires um you know, you really have to be on, be, be very uh, gentle with the throttle on restarts, especially starting off in uh, second gear. So, um, you know, there's a lot of power in those cars. And, you know, if you just mash the gas, you know, you risk um, on restarts, you know, you risk spinning out or, you know, getting run over. And so I was really careful there. And um, I, you know, figure out a way to, you know, restart better and keep up with the leaders. I definitely think that um, can probably uh maybe challenge a little bit more um and stay alongside because i think if i stay alongside leader and and use the top uh and got around him and pinched him down on the bottom would have been able to get around him and potentially steal the win but you know fell back to third actually on the last restart but is able to take it away the guy in front of me got loose coming off the of turn two and i uh, was able to um pick up uh, second once again so finished second there uh but um yeah, I mean, it's a tough car and everything. You got to really, really be on your toes. Uh, it's tempting to run the top like the whole time, but um, really you want to stay away from that as much as possible. Um, you burn up the tires if you run. I mean, because there's speed up there, but at the cost of burning up your tires and actually one of the other races I did, um, I ran uh, at that track, uh, just ran the top uh, a little bit too aggressively and ended up burning up the right rear and not having a whole lot of grip. Uh, so it's a really fine balance between you know, using the top to get around guys and then coming back to the bottom to save your tires, uh, you know, on, on that track. So, um, yeah, it's a really fun car so far trying out, um, definitely recommend, you know, I mean, it's free. So you're, you know, able to run in that car if you have the base membership, I think, but, um, definitely a challenge and, you know, looking forward to the next week and, you know, the rest of the schedule on the cup. Uh, Gen 4 car. Uh, otherwise, um, I racing on uh, Saturday since it was April Fool's Day. You know, you got all these April Fool's jokes coming around. They went out and posted a legitimate post, and they are currently testing uh, rain uh, physics. They posted a picture of a screenshot with you know rain clearly on the track. So wet weather physics currently on the horizon looks like finally after I think years of rumors about them putting on um, you know wet weather. Uh, conditions finally looks like maybe 
soon i don't know exactly when but you know very soon in the near future we could see um you know wet weather rain physics and i racing finally so uh, i feel like the code has kind of been there if you look at the old uh nr 2003 uh, nascar racing 2003 um uh track configuration uh i and i files they always had a setting i think where you could like um classify the track uh or the weather as wet but they just never implemented the um physics part of it so i feel like some of the um foundations of it has probably been there for a while but they've just never finalized it obviously there's the graphics part of it as well um got to be able to um replicate the you know the rain physics or the you know graphics and everything um um you know the uh, obviously the reflections and stuff probably take uh some impact on the graphics that you know they had to really balance and uh try to make sure that there's not a lot of uh hit in that department so um sure there's still some more testing but you know looking forward to you know seeing if that's ever possible and you know maybe someday you know maybe see me on stream or see somebody else uh try it out they'll do the whole curtain herda colton herda uh you know slide that he did last year at indianapolis road course so we'll see if uh you know something like like that ever comes out or you know running nascar uh on on uh wet weather you know potentially that would be interesting to see that as well especially since they've now announced the uh wet weather package on short tracks for nascar and on road courses so that should be interesting to see that happen um otherwise um i think the um so of course indy 500 the i racing officially held indy 500 not happening of course we've been over that many other times and of course um everything but I guess another league uh, that I found online, uh, the major series, they, uh, they're a setup garage. Uh, they provide coaching and um, they provide free setups and paid setups. If you want uh, to download the paid version of uh, the setup for that track for that week for the cup car, Indy car, or whatever uh, they got all that. And I think they've got a, a league on top of that where they run and they are running a, uh, I guess their own version of the Indy 500, but they're, not going to use the IR18 uh, car instead. Uh, they're going to use the uh, IR01, which is basically Delara and iRacing collaborated a couple years ago uh, to develop their own exclusive uh, car that kind of was supposed to be like um, a substitute for the Formula One car uh, in case they couldn't get you know real Formula One car scanned you know for licensing, and so it's kind of got like kind of the same. Uh, handling characteristics and engine characteristics as you know the 2004 2006 era you know v10 v12 era of uh, uh f1 especially in the engine notes it definitely sounds like that era um but they recently have reconfigured it to um be able to compete on oval so they've i guess they've gone and uh, made some oval setups for this car and um i racing is uh has a series on there where you can run like 50 lap races on like some of the ovals and with this car but the point being is that this uh, major series they've gone in um they're going to run the they call it the speedway 500 but of course everyone knows the indy 500 at indianapolis motor speedway and i racing with the delara ir01 should be interesting of course um saw some clips online running at texas running at auto club um i think somebody tried to see if they could break the closed course qualifying record of 241 uh miles an hour by jill deferrin back in 2000 and i think they ran 243 in the game so definitely running up into the 240s and 250s in the draft uh, and saw i racing uh, texas they were running up 255 so definitely pushing those cart speeds from 2001 where the drivers were blacking out to to too high geo too high g forces so definitely should be interesting to see that in i racing and see that type of racing in indianapolis so we'll see um hopefully um i'll be able to be free for that because that's at starting at the end of april early may time frame so hopefully i'll be able to be free uh to be able to run that um and compete on there and everything and we'll we'll put an injury if um you know everything time-wise uh, lines up for that so um i mean real quick go over schedule for i racing this week what i might run or try to do um so yeah it's already up there on the stream actually um let's see we got uh race up next uh series list we'll go by oval uh bristol motor speedway dirt of course you got the nascar class a fixed class a um gen 4 cup fixed at bristol motor speedway paved uh, and then the rest of the NASCAR series, Bristol Motor Speedway Dirt, um, 
NASCAR Legends Series actually at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, so on the NASCAR Oval there, so that might be interesting. Um, got that. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's all for now for that. Uh, um, Road Series, what, what's eligible? Got the uh, Formula Ford Rookie Series at Summit Point Raceway, uh, Indy Pro 2000s, Road America, Global MX-5, uh, Mazda MX-5 at Summit Point Raceway. Uh, so that's what's up for this week. Oh yeah, and then also actually uh, one other thing I did this past week uh, on iRacing. I actually so I ran Formula Ford at Okayama Circuit, uh, which is a road course in Japan, and actually won my my uh, race in that one. So that was pretty good. I haven't won a road in a while, so ran with the Formula Ford. So actually, actually I think it might be my first uh, single seater win in iRacing because I think all the other ones have been in in closed uh, you know rooftop cars, uh, the Mustang MX-5, etc. Uh, so that's actually pretty good. But um, started in the back and then everybody else just kind of took themselves out. So um, either through running into each other or just uh, plane spinning out, but was able to hold on to it, you know, through uh, throughout the race and picked up the win. Uh, so uh, glad I was able to do that. Of course, uh, probably should have streamed that one, but, you know, wanted to um, stream the cup stuff instead. So that that's fine. But um, yeah, uh, that's all I got this week for iRacing course when, do stream you can also look at uh when i post on twitter or subscribe on or follow on twitch twitch tv slash uh ucla2 go on there and watch the streams and watch uh you know all my driving stuff and everything uh of course follow twitter uh JP Huffine, go on there, see all my takes. And of course, Philip mentioned um, earlier, you know, my take on oh, racing in IndyCar, of course, you know, after the great Texas race uh, that we saw on Sunday, um, you know, adding on to, you know, wanting more ovals, you know, want to see Fontana, well, Michigan instead of Fontana because they're getting rid of Fontana, um, Pocono, uh, Milwaukee Mile, and then add on Homestead. Uh, I think those are the four tracks, oval tracks that I'd like to see back on the schedule uh, for IndyCar if they can do it, if they ever uh, decide to put more ovals on the schedule. But yeah, see takes like that on my Twitter, of course, and of course our YouTube channel, uh, Grip Share Podcast on YouTube. Go and subscribe, like, uh, comment, uh, and interact with us on there and watch our videos or listen in with the video in the background or whatever, however you want to consume that. So yeah, that's, uh, that's all I got this week. Of course, always glad to be on the show every week and, you know, be able to discuss everything happened throughout all the series that we talk about with you here. And great job with your wins and com- competitive runs, uh, this past week and we'll see what is going on. I mean, obviously it's a holiday week, so, uh, you know, may have not as much action, um, hence only the one race, of course, ra- the NASCAR with or two races with cup and trucks. But yeah, definitely, uh, it's always great to be on and get this show, keep this show going 163 episodes in. So always a fun time we have here and we're going to keep it going together. And thanks to you as always, um, as my sidekick and right hand man. Uh, picking me up uh, and and helping me out all the time and running the YouTube page as uh, Josh does, helping with the sound on the audio stream and kind of doing some of the mixing on the back end there. Uh, for me, I'm at Philip G. Matthew on Twitter. Um, let's see here for, yeah. Uh, I'm at uh, and our Twitter at Gripstrip Pod. Uh, we also have... Um, yeah, in a, you can find the Grip Strip Podcast basically anywhere that uh, you find podcasts or listen to podcasts. You can uh, find uh, the podcast on Podbean. We shared, we're shared over there, but then we um, go and also post on philipgmatthew.com, my, uh, was it my uh, blog site? So that you can find the show over there. And um, yeah, that's it. We will um, be back next week for um episode 164 uh well actually i'll be remiss i did get to go to yankee stadium be in the presence of an aaron judge home run (laughs) and uh stanton one as well uh kylie gashioka so that was cool getting to the new stadium it's a great place uh to be here i mean it's expensive as hell but it's cold as balls as well which didn't help but definitely had fun uh 
going there and seeing uh, the captain going and getting a, his second home run of the year. And um, who knows? We'll see what happens. We got a calendar out of it, which had a, an error on it, which said DJ LeMay, whose number was the same as Aaron Judge's. So they printed 80,000 copies of that. Uh, at least of those calendars, and they have eighty thousand calendars that have that error. Um, somehow or another, I find that all the time means I probably should have been an editor. Um, once I got out of college, it might have made more sense. But with that, we'll be back next week for episode one sixty four of the Rip Strip Podcast. Um, probably be talking about the Masters a little bit at the afterwards and. Um, Anything sports, there's the NFL draft is this month at the end of the month. Start kind of picking up a little bit more uh, pace on that uh, as the weeks go on. Uh, We'll go over all the racing, the cup and trucks at Bristol and, um, you know, whatever else is coming up next week on the in the world of motorsports. So for Josh, I'm Phil. Uh, Thanks for listening. If you do celebrate Easter and happy Easter and um, you know, uh, Orthodox, uh, they, the Easter is the following week. Uh, there's other stuff that I think I'm missing. So I apologize for that. But, uh, for everyone that does listen, thank you so much for supporting us here on the Gripster podcast. Um, take care. God bless and goodbye.